All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is the Mind Body Marathon podcast here. And today we're going to have a conversation about nutrition. Um, we have my wife to my left and none other than Megan Featherstone with Featherstone Nutrition to my right. And uh, we're going to kind of have a little conversation about performance nutrition and some of her projects and, and some insights with regards to uh, the largest topic in performance we can imagine, which is nutrition. So Megan, uh, fill us in a little bit about some of your current projects. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Well, I just wrapped up a project with Abbott Global where I got my six stars for the Abbott World Marathon Majors in 18 months. So that is insane. Leo was my sidekick here to keep me healthy. Uh, I probably <laughs> would not have stayed healthy without his help. Um, so with that behind us, the new projects are um, going on a summer hydration tour with ASICs. So popping all over the country. Um, and then we'll end in Paris. So we'll be in Paris for the Olympics. Oh, oh my awesome. goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So. So with ASICs? Yep. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It should be so, awesome. So the, the hydration tour here in the States, where are you going with that? So we kick it off actually this week in New York City. And then some other stops are Nashville, Boulder, Chicago, St. Pete. It's a horrible cities to go visit. <laughs> awful. <laughs> awful job. I hate my job. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. So what are you yeah. doing with that? Like what, what's the hydration tour? So last summer we started it myself and my sidekick, Megan Murray. So the Megs went on tour to like the hottest cities and we teamed <laughs> up with scratch hydration and, you know, just educated on the importance because I mean, we seem to think like, Oh, people know what they need to be doing from a hydration mm -hmm. standpoint as runners and people don't, you know, yeah. like I, I think everyone's so individualized with how much they're sweating, how much they're running, what their climate is like, how their body reacts to it. So giving people some tangible advice to get rolling and yeah. then also being able to see how sweaty some of these people are at some yeah. of these events is pretty wild. Um, so that was like really the focus last year. And then this year we're kind of merging that concept into like a road to Paris type huh. thing. So we're kind of awesome. merging the Olympics with what we did last year and we'll kind of see how it goes. This is a very important topic because um you know, you have an element product here. And and so I was talking to one of my patients uh, last week and she was talking about how she went on a uh, long trail run. She was training for a hundred miler and she ran 30 miles in training and she comes home and she was getting ready to go to a party and then she just passes out in the bathroom. And then she ends up in the ER and then she ends up in the hospital for four days with mm -hmm. severe hyponatremia. So she had water toxicity. Mm -hmm. So she was drinking too much water and not enough electrolytes. Mm -hmm. And she just was like an old school runner that didn't really understand the component of true hydration, which is the balance of electrolytes and water. So exactly. can you allude a little bit onto that and give some people in some insight there? Yeah. And so I've been a dietitian for gosh, probably almost 20 years now. And so I was a dietitian clinically before I started running. So when I started running, similar things were happening to me as I didn't really know what I was doing. I was a dietitian, but I was carrying a water bottle. I'm a very heavy, salty sweater and would feel really dizzy at the end of runs, get really confused. My hands were swollen. And I was like, what is happening? <laughs> like what's happening yeah, here? Seriously. So I kind of threw myself into sports nutrition research to try to like help myself. And then I was like, wait a minute, if as a dietitian, I don't realize I need salt with my water when I'm mm -hmm. running, to your point, do other people? Right. right. So that's kind of where this all started was like curiosity for how do I help myself? And then realizing that there was a huge, you know, knowledge gap with a lot of runners, like, oh, I just need water for yeah. hydration where we're losing, you know, a thousand to 2000 milligrams of sodium per hour. And yeah. she's okay. out there for hours. Yeah. It's really well, easy. what's interesting is you alluded to earlier that you were a salty sweater and I'm not, mm -hmm. and I'm one of those people that can finish a workout and I won't have any salt stains anywhere. Like I just, I, I'm not a heavy salty sweater. And so it's really interesting that there is that, that, you know, just like anything, there's, there's sort of, um, um, a continuum on how much water versus salt you can have mm -hmm. and everybody, you just need to sort of tinker with it. Right. You just need to sort of experiment. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of know your symptoms. So when people come to me, sometimes they're having cramping. And it's because they're going into runs dehydrated or they're not taking adequate, you know, fluid or sodium mm -hmm. while they're out there. Or some people have really bad GI issues that's from dehydration. Other people, like I said, get a little bit like confused or out of it. People have trouble recovering. There's yeah. just a million different symptoms that can relate back to a mismatch of sodium and fluid. Yeah. yeah and I definitely think it's something that, as you mentioned, like even as a dietitian, you didn't have that background of knowing about that. 
Because when I started running back in 2011, it's the same thing. You just have that mindset of like, oh, I need to be hydrated. I need to be hydrated. And all you think is like, I got to drink all this water, Mm -hmm. maybe some Gatorade, you know, but you just don't think about like, there's so much more to that than that, you know, which is why products like Element is so fantastic because they already have the right ratios and, and then just knowing your body, like I'm definitely a salty Mm -hmm sweater too, probably because I'm Brazilian and we eat salt on like everything. I mean, it's, it I, is I, genetic. Yeah. yeah like I, I feel like I can never have enough salt. So. Yeah. I remember when I was in high school, I just randomly was like just driving somewhere and I was like listening to the radio and they were talking about how it was, um, Howie Chizik, the old guy that used to be on. Yeah. Yeah. And he was telling this story about how this, this one, uh, I think it was, um, um, it was a radio station down in Columbus. They were doing like a little skit where they were having people like drink water and have a water competition. Yes. And somebody died. Yes. I do remember that. Ooh. And so mm-hmm. I just remember that. I was like, and then I had this thought in the back of my head, like, oh man, people can't drink too much water. Mm-hmm. And so I I always kind of had that in the back of my mind. And then when I worked at a running shoe store, when I first got out of college and people were like looking for like different fueling options and I would be like, well, you know, I would, I would ask them like, when you finish runs, do you have like salt marks on your face or do you mm-hmm. not? And I never do. And like some people like have real salt marks on their shirts and their face and stuff. And like pay attention to that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. It tells you how much you need. Exactly. I mean, we have fancy ways to like figure out how much sodium we're losing per liter of sweat. But for most people, it's like a simple question, right? Like, do you see salt stains? Does it sting when you gets in your eyes? Are you a heavy sweater? There's all these things that can kind of just make us check, check, check. All right, I need more and kind of figure that out. Because I mean, to your point, first of all, we know a lot more now about sports nutrition than we did when I started running in 2009 and you in 2011, you know, we know so much more, but also like conventional nutrition wisdom is don't salt your food. Salt's right. bad. We don't yeah. need that much salt. So like using your client as an example, if she's heard that, or maybe has a diagnosis mm-hmm. of like prehypertension or a family history of hypertension, she's not salting her food. So she's going out here and sweating like crazy, yeah. not replacing those losses from her diet, only drinking water. And this happens a lot. Like this, is, it's very yeah. common for new runners to not mm-hmm. get this quite right. So, so when you go on these hydration tours, is there, um, do you guys do a group run and then afterwards mm-hmm. you kind of do a little education? So at yeah. the Olympics, what formally would that look like then? I don't know. We'll have to see. <laughs> so when you were doing the majors, what yeah. were you doing? Yeah. Like when you're doing the, the tour so, of the majors? For, I think, was it three of the different majors I spoke at the expo? So they had like a different talk or a different topic that mm-hmm. they wanted to talk about. Often it was about fueling during your marathon. So like, you know, fuel early and often. Don't wait to fuel till you feel like you need it. Just some like key messages to yeah. like get across to people. Um, and then other than that, it was kind of like the experience and then documenting the experience on social media to yeah. kind of expose the fact that like Abbott Global is a part of all these marathons that we're all dying to run mm-hmm. across, you know, the country and other countries. Um, yeah, you told me, fun. so speaking of that, you told me that one of the craziest stats I have heard yet this year about London. Yes. So yes. tell me about that. How many people applied it for was, London? What was it? Now I'm blanking. Was it 154,000? No, it was 800. 854. Yeah. 854,000. 449,000 spots? 50,000? Wow. Yeah. yeah. So 850,000 yeah. people, almost a million, applied for 50,000 spots. I mean... I think we have job security. Here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I running mean, like running really is like it's booming. It's booming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's it's even now more than ever, there are more people getting into it. So it's more important to really understand the dynamics of fueling, the dynamics mm-hmm. of, of hydration and things like that, because more people might not be educated on this. Mm-hmm. Now, I've done, you know, some of like the big races, like I did Chicago, some, you know, more like intense running races. But I tend to do mostly Disney races and Disney races brings in all kinds of people and it brings in a lot of novice runners that I'm sure a lot of what you have to share would be brand new to them. Mm -hmm. Now, doing the tour that you did with Abbott, do you you have any feel for what kind of audience did you have? Because those races are harder to get into. A lot of people, you know, like I didn't know that even existed until I got more into the running world. So do you find that you have more seasoned runners that maybe are harder to accept the message because they've had like old school ingrained, maybe outdated information that they just swear by? Or, you know, do you still see a good, do you feel like you get a good blend of novice people that it's like their first time they're like deer in headlights, like give me all the information, tell me what to do. I think it's a huge mix, a huge mix. And I mean, with that stats, right. And when I was spectating Chicago, I think, you know, I'm usually up there finishing, you know, and then I leave and I don't see the kind of the back of the Packers, but I went back to see a friend finish around six hours. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, there's more people finishing Chicago right now than when I finished, you know, like it's just wild, the span of athletes that finish a marathon. So I think, it is all over the board. 
And I do see to your point, like some of the seasoned runners, we didn't know any of what we know now about sports nutrition. Like one of the panels that I did, I was interviewing Joan Benoit Samuelson. And I said, when you won Boston, what did you fuel with? And she took the mic out of, away and she whispered to me across the couch we were on. She's like, you really want me to answer this? <laughs> and I was like, yes, we want to hear. And she was like, nothing. We didn't drink. We didn't eat. <laughs> yes. I didn't ingest anything. But in yeah, there was this badge of honor back in that era. Yeah. yeah. We didn't know anything about that. We know so much more now. So some well, of that, people, that's like back to the duel in the sun conversation mm -hmm. with Salazar and, and Beardsley and how they're, they literally did not want to take one moment away from competition right. and they were just slugging it back and forth. And so they, they wouldn't, they didn't consume anything. Right. And now we know through all the Nike research and Morton research that Kipchoge can take over a hundred grams of carbohydrates an hour hmm. and break two hours in the marathon, you know? So we know that like that high carbohydrate availability is like key to performance yeah. at that high intensity. So how many more? And so in a marathon, so in a two hour marathon for him, how many Mortons is that? <laughs> so I actually tried to find this information and they were very hush hush about it, but he actually used the drink mix, the okay. drink mix. Yeah. So you can get like 80 grams of carbs in a bottle, but what they actually did is they had him drink it and then he would toss the bottles and then they would weigh the bottles to find out how much he actually okay. took. I mean, I'm sure there was a plan, but then there was also like a more preciseness to yeah. what he yeah. got down. Um, but then they never really published those stats. It was just like this, like around a hundred grams. So do you know what, uh, Kelvin was doing? I don't, I don't, I would have to look that I, gosh, I would have to imagine he was doing yeah, something similar. Probably something very similar. I would think so. Cause a lot of them, I mean, if you think about watching them, right? Like I was there when he, mm -hmm. you know, broke the record and won at Chicago. So we can see them on TV. They grab a bottle. Most elites don't rip open a gel, you know, yeah. everything they need is in that bottle. So I would assume. So, so what is the, so from your perspective, what is the advantage of fluid versus an actual gel? I think it's an all in one for them. So they're getting their fluid, their sodium, their carbs yeah. all at once. It's just us peons don't have <laughs> table access to service. bottles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sounds, I would. So, I would but if that. somebody has access to that, like if they're mm -hmm. doing an ultra or something mm -hmm. like that, and there is like an actual, you know, aid station, should they be doing more of that kind of stuff? I mean, I think it's, it, you have to, you yeah. know, that you have to be relying like carrying on a your, bottle or, or mm -hmm. camelback or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I work with a lot of like triathletes as well. And I always like really try to get them to get a lot of carbs into their bottles on the bike where it's like mm -hmm. built in. Our yeah, fuel is right, right here. It. And then we don't have to worry about as much solid fuel. And we kind of find that mix. So do you try to get people to that hundred per hour? Or are you just basically like, you know, or is there sort of a, a basement for people? So I try to at least get people to 50 grams, 50 of grams an hour okay. is kind of the starting point for most people because most people aren't even doing that. And then once we get people there, depending on their body size, their performance goals, mm -hmm. their experience with fueling, that's where I kind of start to push people up a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, typical sports nutrition recommendations are actually not body weight based. It's time based. But what I found is like 190 pound male runner that's trying to break three fuel needs are much different than a yeah. hundred pound female, you know, so yeah. we're going to, I'm going to fuel that them a little sense. bit harder. So what, so during a performance, where does the electrolytes fall into that? And again, this kind of goes back to what we were saying, depending on like how much people are losing. Mm -hmm. So I have some people that can use Morton products that are very low in sodium and be fine. And we interviewed one of the lead scientists from Morton on our fuel for the soul podcast. And he, he's like, you don't need sodium when you're running. Like, that's why we don't put it in our product. People don't need it. And I just kind of kept my mouth shut because I'm yeah. like, some people don't. <laughs> I work with a lot of people who do, yeah. you know, so it kind of depends. Like, just, what, yeah. So would you say then in that situation, is it more advantageous for people to load up on sodium before they run and mm -hmm. just have it in the reserves? Yeah. So I'll have I, a lot of people do that. Yeah. So, and then, mm -hmm. so that way then maybe they don't have to be so obsessed when they, so she needs mm -hmm. to actually take it for sure. Um, when she runs, she's definitely one of those people that she I always do, like, has to have. I like the pure salt sodium pills. Yeah. Like, yeah, like I the need salt so stick. Much, yeah. I also have yeah, pots. Stick, yeah. yeah, I also have pots. So like my sodium intake mm -hmm. needs to be higher anyways because mm -hmm. of that. Even when I'm not exercising. So yeah, never mind during a run. So yeah. it's like all the salt, please. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and you feel so much better. Like yes. same with me. As soon as I figured out, like I need more sodium, I well, felt so much better. So that's a great point. Like, is it? So is there too much? I get that question constantly because again, it's like sodium's bad. We don't. How would I know if I'm getting too much? And unfortunately, the symptoms of getting too much are the same as the symptoms of not getting enough. Yeah, like your hands swelling, like bloated. You know, all those types of things. Like they're very, very similar. Mm -hmm. So it kind of goes back to trial and error. And yeah. yes, you could potentially get too much, but most people are 
not getting enough. Well, versus- what I would say to that, what I usually tell my patients is that one of the most tightly regulated systems in the body is sodium balance. Mm-hmm. Because if you ask your question from a true physiology standpoint, what is the point of sodium? And the point of sodium has, there's a lot of reasons for sodium in the body, but one of the reasons is to tell water where to go. So water is obviously very important for all the cells. So it's like, that's how your body knows where to go is it sort of follows sodium. And that system is tightly regulated. And all the research that they did, you know, on, on like blood pressure was they would take people would ingest sodium and then they would measure their blood pressure within like, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. And of course it would be elevated, but within a half hour to an hour, it's back to normal because your body got the rest of the sodium out. And so that's where all that faulty research came, where the hate for salt came. Yeah. And to your point, for people who are really heavy sweaters or don't perform very well in the heat, there's some really good research to like hyperhydrate. Mm -hmm. So like jack up sodium to like 15, 16, 1700 milligrams with like 20 ounces of water to get yourself to hang on to it. Just like you would eat like a salty meal and you wake up and you feel swollen, like intentionally trying to do that. But the thing to your point, I always try to get people to do it within like 12 hours of their race because Mm -hmm. Our body's smart. It's going to get rid of the extra, right? So it's like we kind of have to fool our body to hang on to it. Yeah. So I typically tell people to do that the night before a morning run or a morning race, but then there's like a Boston. So it's like, when do we do it? Do we do it in the morning? (laughs) Do we, you know, and that's kind of, it's a little nuanced. Yeah. Well, okay. So I think that's a great segue then. So to hyperhydrate. So what about the idea of like carb loading? Mm -hmm. So what does the recent recent research say about that? So I'm a huge fan of carb loading too. And that's the other thing, like carbs with the devil for so long. So we have these runners who aren't getting enough sodium, they're not staying hydrated, and they're scared of carbs as they increase their mileage. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand why their performance is improving, why they're not recovering, why their paces are getting slower. And it's just they don't have enough carbohydrates left in their body as as glycogen where we store our carbs. So there's really good research, we can improve performance up to like 7% if we're carb loaded for a race effort marathon. So like if we're going out there regardless of our fitness and trying to race at the top of our fitness level, if we have full glycogen stores, we're going to decrease our risk of hitting Mm -hmm. the wall and being able to hold that pace for the last 10K, which is huge, right? That's the hardest part of the race. Yeah. Yeah, And I'm I'm sure that the, the industry has definitely shifted quite a bit to hating carbs. And what I tell people is that there's no more important nutrient for performance. No. And I, I get it if in a base phase you want to tinker with like, you know, sort of fat adaptation and things like that, which I think there's some benefit to that. But also when it comes to performance, like you genuinely just need carbohydrates. Like that's right. what your body needs the most during that performance. Yeah. And like trying to keep it simple. Like when people are like, I don't know, am I getting enough carbs? Like I'm feeling really flat in my workouts or I'm not recovering. I'm like, throw some carbs at it. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? Right. You still feel the same. Most likely you're going to feel better. Yeah. And then you're going to be like, oh. Okay, that's what it feels like when I'm not eating adequate carbs when I'm training. When I was in college, there was this old school exercise physiology book, um, McArdle exercise phys book or whatever that I I was like always kind of plowing through. And in passing, they sort of mentioned that if you have overtraining syndrome to just increase your carb intake. Mm -hmm. And they were literally like just to have an extra bagel a day kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And so I would tell my teammates that and it would fix a lot of scenarios where people literally would just be like really run down, like really anxious, just not recovering in workouts. And then like, dude, just eat more, like literally just mm-hmm. eat more. I would just say it like that. And then mm-hmm. have a little bit more rice at dinner, have an extra bagel. And then they would respond really well and improve it. And they've done research. They're trying to figure out, is there even such a thing as overtraining or is it always underfueling? And yeah. Like the line is so that blurry. Right. And, yeah. and Viho would always say there is no overtraining. There's just under resting. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. his, his uh, training or his, his partner coach, Terrence Mahone would always say there's under fueling. So they they were like, you know, one was over, you need to over rest. And then one was like, mm-hmm. you need to overeat. Right. And that's no, what, yeah, go ahead. Our um, podcast with Katie Moon a couple of weeks ago or last week, she mentioned how like on her rest day, she's like, I truly rest. Like mm-hmm. I'm on my couch. I'm not doing chores. I'm not running errands, which I think a lot of people don't think of it that way. Yeah. You know, because it's like, oh, it's my rest day. So they're not doing a run, but then they're still like going grocery shopping or, you know, taking the kids to the playground or whatever and not actually off their feet resting Mm -hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that um yeah there there was a key point i was just going to make about that um there i would say when uh man what is it um the resting or the under fueling the under fueling (laughs) 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 just had a mind blank 
So I was going to say when you brought up like that, you mentioned like anxiety and passing yeah. through that. And I, I see that a lot with people when they're under fueling, they don't feel hungry, but they're like, I'm so anxious all of a sudden. Yeah. And it's like, that's your body's hunger cue. Because sometimes our hunger cues get a little bit skewed mm -hmm. when we're training hard. And sometimes it's not like, oh, my stomach's growling. It's I'm exhausted. It's I'm irritable. I'm anxious. So yeah. it's like kind of redefining like what are your they're cues angry. Right, right. when you're not fueling. Enough. So now yeah. I remember. <laughs> but this is the so this is interesting because a lot of people, a lot of my patients, when I talk to them about this, and they're in they're they're definitely trying to recover more. And I can tell that their body's not recovering. You know, I'll be working on them and I'm just like, you're just in a funk right now and just eat more. Well, they're always worried about gaining weight. Mm -hmm. But what I tell them is like, look, you don't have to worry about that because your body will use those nutrients. Just make sure it's good nutrients. Don't eat like processed carbs or whatever. Like eat good, good, healthy, you know, foods. Like, mm -hmm. and we know this from like nutrition research with with regards to like burn victims. So, you know, when people have like massive third degree burns on their body, they'll give them a huge surplus of, of calories and they don't gain weight. Their nutrition needs a roof. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and because they're just repairing all this damaged tissue. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're working out at such a massively high level mm -hmm. and you have, you know, all these nutritional needs based on how much damage you're putting on the body, it's like critical to go over the top actually. Yeah. And you know, to that point, so many people are stuck in like the my fitness health culture of like i need to eat what i'm burning that day like people are trying to like match those numbers so our rest day i'm not burning any energy i shouldn't be eating as much and it's like there's research to show like on rest day our nutrition needs are even higher than some other days because we're repairing yeah. all that damage so it's like really trying to undo some of these false nutrition things that people have been following over their life yeah. when they are trying to put that performance piece in there. And, and it's interesting because, you know, one of the advantages that I have with athletes is that I will follow them through a season. And this has been the case even with you. It's like at the beginning of a training cycle in a base phase, the body will feel a certain way. And then the muscles aren't, aren't as reactive, the tissue's not as dense. Then as time goes on, the body, literally the frame just starts to solidify and the nervous system is really adapt and twitchy. And I can tell if somebody's like right peaking, or I can tell if somebody's overshot their peak, you know, and they're on the down, on, on can the you descent. Tell me this when you know yeah, this is no, it's actually amazing. I usually <laughs> don't say anything unless it's a positive. Okay. Like when I say, "Oh, dude, you're gonna run out of your mind," like I mean it. Like yeah. that's a thing. Like yeah, that's why. But if I'm like, "Hey, dude, you need to like yeah. you know focus on rest the next couple of weeks," yeah. like really just like hunker down on an eating and focus on rest, and it's like you're not where you need to be. Right. Like, you know, so there are. I'll say those subtle things. I won't say it directly, but. Yeah. And and I and I learned this trick because like when you're treating somebody like trackside at the trials or like at USA's, like you can make or break their performance right. if you say That's the wrong okay. thing. And I hear people say the wrong thing all the time. And at the highest level you can imagine. Yeah. Like yeah. the highest level. You see people on TV and you're like, why did you say that to them? Like right. before they went out and raced. Yeah. I it drives me absolutely bananas. And so there's a time and a place to say those things. And you can subtly be like, Dude, tonight, like, just get a little bit extra rest, go to bed early, a little early. You know, it's like those kind of things, like, you're not where you need to be, dude. Right. Or, like, yeah, don't say that. You know, like, <laughs> don't say that. But, like, I don't know. Like, it just drives me crazy with performance. But, but you can it also absolutely works for feel pregnant it. women. Actually. I can shot call so, pregnant. Yeah, yeah. He's done that to my sister and a couple of the patients because he can tell, like, oh, yeah, their body's ready to go. Cause, like, right. sometimes, like, I'll, I'll adjust <laughs> them and I'm treating them and the muscles are like just fighting me. And they're like, their due date's there or like a week later yeah. or something like that. They're like close and I'm adjusting them and treating them and like their body is fighting me. And then they'll come in for another visit. And then all of a sudden, like everything just moves like butter. And I'm like, it's going to happen. Like it's going to happen like soon, like 36 hours max kind of thing. And it, and it's and happened it every time. Yeah. Except because it, it's a peak. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Like that's yeah. what, that's the greatest peak of all time right. is pregnancy yeah. and your body heading into that is resisting. Cause it's formalized. It's like, it's like corralling all its reserves, reserves for the actual event itself. And then when it's time to go, the nervous system is just like super adapt. It's, it's pretty wild. cool. Wild. The human body's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> so what are some other tips you can give people with regards to like performance and, and sort of helping out? So we talked a little bit about the carb loading. So what are some of the specifics of that? Like what is the timing and, the, you know, does it matter the night before or the couple nights before and all that? Yeah. So there's really no time frame that we can carb load, like we can build glycogen anytime, right? So a lot of the research in carb loading is actually a 24 hour carb load of like 12 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight, which is a ton. Wait, of repeat that again. 12 grams of carbohydrates per kilogram of okay. body weight. So that ends up being like 800, 900 <laughs> grams of carbs, yeah. a thousand grams of carbs for some people. And what I've found is like, it 
that it's just not going to happen, yeah. especially the day before a race. Like people are not going to be able. A thousand grams of carbs is 4,000 yeah. calories yeah. of carbs. Yep. Well, That's yeah. crazy. It's a lot to eat, <laughs> right? So typically the way that I do it, I put a calculator on my website where people can just plug their weight in because not everyone is like speaking in kilograms. So what website is that? Featherstonenutrition.com. Perfect. And it'll spit out like what you need to eat and you can pick if you want to do a two day carb load or a three day carb load. So people can see like, can I eat this nice. much in two days or should I expand it to three? I would say 95% of people do a three day carb load mm -hmm. just because it's, it's really hard to get that much in, especially if you're traveling to your race. I have had some people that like don't love to eat a ton of carbs right before their race. So they'll carb load and then take a day off right before. So, so I mean, there's no right or wrong way to do it as long as you're eating enough. So, you know, we can be kind of, creative with how we get it done. Now, does that fluctuate, as you mentioned, but depending on their body weight, obviously, but then like what event they're doing or like their paces, or is it just based on their, like the pace itself doesn't matter if they're performing at their top fitness level, whatever right. that looks like, how does that work? Right. And that's what I always say. It's so easy to compare ourselves to where we used to be like, oh, I'm not in that shape anymore. I'm yeah. not running that fast. I'm like, okay, but are you running the, as fast as your body can take you right now right. in this marathon? They're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, you need to carb load then, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and honestly, some of the benefits are you're more mentally engaged, which we know how mental a marathon is. And then also, again, like not hitting that wall and not losing that pace in that last 10K and being able to continue to run at the yeah. pace that you started at. So yeah. now what about how much does this is definitely quite a bit of a pivot, but how much does um, allergies play a role into some of your nutritional guidance? Yeah, I, some people come to me with like true allergies and then some mm -hmm. people come to me with like some intolerances or preferences that they want to avoid a certain thing. Um, and, you know, the nice thing about all the crazy fad diets that kind of come, come in and out is there's more products available for people. So when yeah. I was in nutrition school, you know, we had our gluten-free lab where we had to try to create gluten-free, you know, pizza dough mm -hmm. and like all these things in the kitchen. And we were like tinkering in there and there was no products available Nothing. back in the early 2000s. Cause I started, yeah. Like yeah. We, I started gluten-free with my daughter in 2012 oh, and it was, it was like, 2008. Yeah. Nothing. Luckily I lived in Atlanta nothing. at the time because there was a lot of options because there's a lot of health food st stores yeah. there, but yeah. not up here. You had like two bread, you know, but anyway, <laughs> now there's like a million things that you can get yeah. that are, you know, dairy free, vegan, um, you know, gluten free. Like there's so many options now that I think it makes it easier for people who do want to or have to. Why do you feel like there's, there's this increase in interest in that? And why do you feel like people have maybe a little bit more intolerances to these things? I think some of it is a, misperception, right? That gluten is bad. Like gluten's not necessarily bad for most people, yeah. right? There are some people that it is for, right? People with allergies, people with different medical conditions that maybe it helps mm -hmm. them. Yeah. But for the majority of people, like it's okay, you know, but I think there's just a lot of misinformation out there that makes people think yeah. that like dairy is bad for us. And it's like, it doesn't have to be, you know, for right. some people, sure. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I, I definitely think there's, there's a lot of vested interest in and this this is the rise of social media. I think in order for people to get a little bit more popular, they have to sort of pick a niche, mm -hmm. a niche, and mm -hmm. sort of hunker down on that. And then that becomes their camp. Mm -hmm. And then you become I don't know. It's like this weird siloed effect where everybody's sort of you know this guy's carnivore and this guy's paleo, and then and then you have the whole vegan yeah. movement and everything. And it's like you know it really just becomes like you said a fad. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think it's like just questioning our own beliefs about nutrition and making sure that the choices we're making are supportive of how we feel we want to eat and then also our performance. So what are some bare minimum necessities that you would say for people? So there are, there's the fat thing and there's the restricted side, but what are, mm -hmm. what are the non-negotiables? So I think eating adequately, eating enough for what we're asking our body to do is huge. And, you know, I work with both men and women. It's a larger portion of women, but I see the same things in men is that we're often under fueling. For what we're doing. We don't realize the tax and the energy expenditure that comes with training for a race. So first and foremost, like, let's make sure we're eating enough, right? And then secondly, let's make sure we're eating enough of the right things. And then third, timing. So I yeah. see a lot of people, like, honestly, you could be at the end of the day eating enough, but if your timing isn't right around your training, you know, that's a huge thing that I work with people for. So the timing, that's an interesting conversation. You have like the intermittent fasting and mm -hmm. whole fasting movements and stuff. So how does the timing, what's a, what's a little bit of a cue that people can have with that? So I really try to make sure that like, where are we running in the day? Is it the morning? Is it the evening? Make sure we're padding that 
activity with adequate nutrition. So what are we doing right before it? What are we doing after to recover? And making sure that that area of our biggest energy expenditure for the day is surrounded by really solid nutrition because we're going to get better performance and then we're going to get better recovery, which is going to help the next day and the whole, to your point, training cycle, being able to tolerate that training a little better. Now, besides the carb, like one of the things, especially for, I guess I have to put myself into the pool of the aging population nowadays, um, realizing how much more protein we also need, you know, especially compared to maybe how much protein you needed as a Mm 20-year-old athlete or training versus, you know, especially for women that Mm -hmm. are, you know, hitting towards perimenopause and menopause and things like that. So Mm -hmm. how do you incorporate that? How, you know, do you have like a calculator for that? Like, how do you help out with that? That's a huge thing. It's my kryptonite too. Like I hate protein. It's like every meal. It's like, where's my protein? Oh no. Yeah. Being Brazilian. It's like if I lived if I lived in Brazil, it'd be easier (laughs) because it's all about like, yes, please bring us the entire plate of just meat and (laughs) not have anything else. But here in the day to day, it's a little bit harder too. Yeah. So I try to get, again, I always talk in kilograms, which drives people bonkers, but I try to get people to have like 0.4 to 0.55 grams yeah. of protein per kilogram per meal. So a lot of times we talk about like, this is what I need in a day. But mm-hmm. when it comes to protein, like our body can't store protein. Our storage form of protein is muscles, right? right? And we need protein to develop hormones and enzymes and all sorts of things to repair all day mm-hmm. long. So if we're not eating adequate protein, we're breaking down muscle mass, which is not congruent with performance. Right. So I really try to get people to focus on hitting their particular protein goal three times a day, not necessarily trying to hit like a daily value of protein. So if you're saying the kilograms per Mm -hmm. pound, all of that. One to 1.5, right? Gram per pound. Yeah. yeah, So tangibly, what would that look like in a meal? It's usually like 20 to 40 grams of protein per meal for most people. So like to your point, when we're over 40, we need more. Like an egg, for example? An egg is only seven grams of protein. So like... (laughs) This morning, for example, I'll use myself. I had like an egg sandwich, but I was like, I don't want to eat that many eggs. So I had an egg and two egg whites, and then I had a yogurt on the side. So that got me 35 grams of protein. You know, so you really do. I mean, oh, I have a boiled egg in the morning. I'm like, that's Uh neat. Like if you have like a 10, like what's a 10 ounce steak? Like what would that be? A gram or an ounce of protein is around seven grams. Okay. So what would that be? That's pretty good. Like 70 then? Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. Well, okay, so yeah, I mean, I, there is some research research showing that as um, as females age, that because of the shift in hormones, they do absorb protein less mm-hmm. effective, right? Right, and that's huge. And and yeah. then it becomes the emphasis on complete proteins, mm-hmm. which I think is really more the emphasis on people consuming collagen to help complement that, mm-hmm. because collagen is not a protein. It should not be a protein supplement, but right. it should it it makes the protein you take in more effective. They kind of say that. So I think like as you know, essentially you're talking about aging female. It's like vitally important because yeah. sarcopenia is massive issue is for an aging female. Right. And that's like a brand new thing too. Like mm-hmm. I feel like in the last year, two years, it's when all of a sudden you're hearing about, you know, you should be, women should be lifting more weights because it's mm-hmm. always the fear. Because well, you come into that. it with less muscle right. usually. And that's right. the big thing. And then you get yeah. the shift in hormones, which make you absorb it less. Mm-hmm. But that's like all new information, it seems like, right. coming out, you know. And again, you, we can all use ourselves as guinea pigs, as I know we all do. Like, I think about when I was nursing my kids and your hormones were in the toilet. I had, like, no muscle mass. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yes. I think back on that, I was like, what was, like, <laughs> what were you doing, you yeah. know? But, you know, the same thing, you know, as hormones change or even as men get older, right? We know it takes, to your point, it takes more protein to stimulate our muscles to recover than it did when we were in our 20s like yeah. double. The so amount. yeah, usually yeah. what I just tell people, if you weigh 150 pounds, just focus on 150 grams, mm-hmm. maybe a smidge more than that. If you're in a high level of performance, because that's about a gram per pound of body weight. Mm-hmm. So yeah. just kind of, that keeps it easy um, for us Americans that, yeah. <laughs> and I guess British. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably why I feel better when we're in Brazil. Cause I'm just like eating meat all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And protein keeps us full longer too. Like it's the macronutrient the satiety. keeps yeah. us full the longest because digestion starts in the stomach. So it stays there longer. It empties slower. So most people feel better if they're getting that adequate protein at each meal, then they're recovering faster. Like it's all a win-win mm-hmm. situation, but I'm, I'll tell you what, like a lot of people aren't doing it. Like even my guys are getting enough for the day, but they're not hitting yeah. it after their runs to actually recover. So what are some ways, because I know the vegan community for sure struggles the most with this. What would you say are, are convenient ways they can they can improve this? I saw the own shakes upstairs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are some good pre-made yeah. like vegan protein powder or protein supplements. I always just tell people, if you are getting a plant-based supplement, we got to make sure there's enough leucine in it because leucine is kind of the amino acid yes. that's typically good. deficient in non-animal based proteins. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you're getting like a sport protein, like momentous sport or garden of life sport, because they're going to fortify that plant-based protein back with the leucine so that, and honestly, I, I 
don't think I work with anyone who's plant-based that doesn't take a protein like yeah. supplement at least once a day when they're training Good. hard because it's just so hard to get it otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're kind of coming a little bit to the close here. So, um, you know, any last parting tips you can give people in this uh, kind of short podcast here? I think, you know, like think about what your goals are from a performance standpoint and think about is your nutrition supportive of that? Because nutrition that's supporting our performance is going to look a lot different than if we're not trying to eat for performance. So just questioning where you're at. Is it adequate? If it's not, find someone to help, find information, you know, to help support that because nutrition can truly be that missing piece to the recovery, to the performance, to really allow you to continue to excel in your sport instead of as we get older, feeling like we're done, you know, like yeah. you hit do. a wall and you can't right. get past there. We can, we can continue to improve. Yeah. So how can people find you? You can find me on Instagram at Featherstone Nutrition. And then my website is featherstonenutrition.com. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks again for coming in studio here. And uh, we really appreciate all the insight and, and all the information you gave us today. And Hopefully uh, we can get you on again soon because I know there's a wealth of information in there. So appreciate it. Have fun uh, in your hydration tour <laughs> in yeah. Paris. That'll be awesome. I know we look forward to seeing all that. Thanks for having me. Yep. All the best. <laughs>